starts right now. Either get off the pot. Like, you guys need to figure it out because this isn't right. It frustrated and fuming, a South Texas community dealing with water problems for yet another week. What county leaders said when we went looking for answers. And another state joining Texas in its movement of migrants. The flights now landing at a vacation hotspot coming up. Plus a family of one of the victims in Uvalde taking a stand. They're meeting with a Texas lawmaker. But first. You can imagine this. They had no water for weeks and a week after we shared their story, a community says that it's still in the same predicament. So we went back to the South Texas community of Derby today to try and get some answers. The unincorporated community in Frio County says some donations for water have come in, but that isn't a permanent solution. The night team's John Paul Barajas took neighbors concerns to the Frio County judge. They did drop some off at the church, but who knows how long that's going to last. I mean, water goes by fast. It's a much appreciated drop in the bucket for Derby residents. Good Samaritans, Frio County officials, and a food bank donating cases of water over the last week. But those who live there still feel like Frio County and their water provider are failing them. Do you feel like some of those residents there or the residents there might have been forgotten for a few weeks? I believe so. I believe so. Uh, but again, uh, it, it's kind of difficult, I guess, uh, being out there in the middle of nowhere in a sense. County Judge Arnulfo Luna says it's complicated getting involved since Derby has a private water company. He says the county has hit its $15,000 budget for hauling tanks of water to Derby. That water is supposed to be used for utilities. But Luna adds the county can continue providing bottled drinking water. Residents tell us Friday marked the county's first water delivery in several weeks. What we were told is that water was only provided to residents there for the first two weeks. It could be. Uh, what happened after the first two weeks? That I couldn't tell you. The county judge also said the local church has a few wells. It's really small. It only has like 20 gallons. He thinks the pastor could do more for residents. Is it the church's responsibility to provide water for all? <laughs> no, but again, well, where's the Christianity to come in? You know, help your fellow man. You know, that's that's my belief in that right there. Uh, the need is there. Uh, Do you feel like you satisfied the need on your end for those residents? Not, re not really. For those struggling to survive in Derby, they see no end in sight. I feel that I should start looking for another place to live. The county judge says Derby residents who run out of water can call the county and they'll go drop off more. I also spoke to the owner of Derby ING, the water company, and he still does not have a timeline on when repairs will be finished. So, John Paul, let's do this another way. Is the state aware of the problem? Yes, in fact, the water company's owner told me he spoke to the Texas Commission on Water Equality today. TCEQ says it investigated Derby ING last month and issued a notice of enforcement for its violations of the state administrative code. We asked what that means and if it comes with any consequences, but we're still waiting to hear back. Both TCEQ and the Texas Water Development Board tell us they're working with the water company to help expedite repairs. Steve, Stephania. John Paul, thank you. In other news now, we want you to take a look at your screen because that woman, 22-year-old Brianna Woods, hasn't been seen or heard from since last Tuesday. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is hoping that someone's seen her, that someone knows where she is. She was last seen in the 200 block of Consiglio near Green Valley Road in Cibolo. She's 5'3", 125 pounds. She has black hair, brown eyes, and a butterfly tattoo on her right leg along with a nose piercing. Anybody with information on where she is can call the BCSO Missing Persons Unit. That number is on your screen at the very top in the middle there, 210-335-6000. It's a controversial move, but yet another state joining Texas in the effort to relocate migrants. The state of Florida sent two planes of migrants to the vacation hotspot of Martha's Vineyard today. That's in Massachusetts. A spokeswoman for Governor Ron DeSantis says the state is choosing, quote, sanctuary destinations, end quote. Officials in Martha's Vineyard say they were not aware the migrants were coming, but they are working to provide short term housing for them. Texas continues to also send asylum seekers out of state. Just over the weekend, about 90 migrants arrived in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, which is 
about 30 minutes away from Chicago. They're staying at a La Quinta Inn there. Elk Grove Village's mayor said initially the village was caught off guard. The state of Illinois says they're trying to send out notifications as quickly as possible as more migrants are expected. And now Chicago's mayor plans to coordinate with Elk Grove Village in the future. Trending tonight, lots of questions surrounding the way that the bodies of unidentified migrants are being handled. Those concerns are coming to light after a viral video that was first shared on TikTok. That video shows sunken graves for the migrants with markers leading us back to Memorial Funeral Chapel. Now, there are also PVC pipes that are used as makeshift crosses. You see them right there. That video was recorded back in August at the Maverick County Cemetery. And our Alicia Barrera tried to get answers from the funeral home. We're trying to get some statements regarding the PVC cemetery. We can talk. You can call the county judge. I'm not the owner, ma'am. Now, we did speak with the county judge who confirmed the funeral home has an agreement to retrieve and bury the bodies of undocumented immigrants. The judge says that commissioners voted to replace PVC crosses with metal markers as part of a humanitarian effort. The Maverick County judge is concerned that they may run out of space, though, to bury more bodies and will begin to use reefers to store some bodies. The push for gun reform continues. One of the victims' families from Uvalde took their concerns to Senator Ted Cruz today. Alexandria Rubio, who also went by Lexi, is one of 21 victims killed when an 18-year-old gunman fired a semi-automatic assault-style rifle into the school, into her classroom. Rubio's mother posted a picture of her visit with Senator Ted Cruz today. Rubio's parents say they showed the senator a picture of their daughter in her child-sized casket and asked the senator to support a federal ban on assault weapons. They say Cruz declined. The senator recently backed a bill that he says would involve a focus on student mental health, more security like fences, and increased law enforcement. You may remember multiple law enforcement agencies responded to the shooting at Robb Elementary back in May. It took more than an hour before that gunman was taken down. Guns, abortion rights, and immigration, these are expected to be some of the issues driving voters to the polls this November. Right now, 1,219,000 people are registered to vote in Bear County, but there's still time for that number to grow. And if you haven't done so already, you have until October 11th to register for the election in November. And if you're mailing your application, just make sure that it's postmarked by October 11th. By the way, the election takes place on November 8th. The Bear County Elections Office is also trying to get more poll workers for the election. And this Saturday, it's hoping to meet with different groups made up of military veterans. That was that's just such an untapped pool of really civic minded duty. So we're looking forward to that. And they said their goal would be to have a, a vet at every single poll site. And I just think that's a wonderful goal for us to have. Bear County commissioners press the Bear County Elections Office to provide 302 voting sites, but right now there are only 267. Right now, let's take a quick look at some of today's big headlines in your night beat news flash. A cartel connection in a gruesome killing. Edgar De La Cruz shot and killed 17 year old Sebastian Carpio before burning his body in a stolen vehicle. An idea that investigators say he got from family connections to the cartel. He shared that his uncle told him stories of how people get rid of bodies in Mexico and for the cartel, which gave him the idea of how to not get caught after shooting Sebastian. That testimony came to light as De La Cruz aged out of the Texas juvenile system. He only served 11 months of his 25 year sentence. Instead of releasing him on parole, a judge today decided that De La Cruz must continue his sentence in the adult prison system. Some adjustments made to San Antonio's city budget proposal. City Council will take up a final vote tomorrow. The adjustments include more money for the Martin Luther King Jr. March, more funds for sidewalk repair, and extending the city's pool season. We're still waiting to see what council will decide to do with that $50 million in extra CPS energy revenue that's coming in. Many of the members of council either didn't choose a side or didn't appear to support the plan to send rebates to customers. We'll see what happens tomorrow. And crowds of people are saying their last goodbyes to Queen Elizabeth II. Up to 750,000 people expected to visit Westminster Hall, where she now lies in state. The visits will be happening until Monday. The White House says President Joe Biden called King Charles III today to offer his condolences. 
Officials telling those waiting in line they could be waiting up to 30 hours for their turn. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. You're watching There is a Hope for Healing. It's what one nonprofit is trying to do for the city of Uvalde, the contribution it's making, and how you can help. It's coming up. And a first of its kind coming to South Texas. One mother says it will not only ease her challenges, but help other families as well. The deal involving a dentist chair. It's coming up next on The Night Beat. All right, let's keep it real. Most people don't like going to the dentist, but it's much harder for people with special needs. And in less than two years, that's going to be easier. A specialty dental clinic that focuses on those with medical complexities is going to open. The night team's Patty Santos tells us that it's going to be the first of its kind right here in South Texas. All we're going to do is take a look with our cute mirror. See, look at this tooth mirror. You go to a regular family dentist, they refuse to treat her because she needs a special antibiotic cover. A simple dental checkup can be stressful for an adult or child with medical complexities. Just ask their caregiver. I took her to my family dentist and he was like, I can just examine her. Shriya Prasanna feels lucky that staff at UT Health San Antonio School of Dentistry can meet her child's so delicate needs. Mouth. I just want you to open real big for me, sweetheart. Good. And bite down. Does anything hurt there at all? Soon their services will be expanded even further thanks to a $2 million federal grant. If you have a special needs child, they may not be able to express the fact that they have a toothache the same way uh, uh, another child would. So it's important to really that they have know about this resource and have access. School Dean Dr. Peter Loomer says the Phil and Karen Hunker Special Care Clinic is going to be life changing okay. for an estimated 50,000 patients over the course of five years. The school already provides care for children and families with special needs, but this program will be more specialized. Two looks fine. It's an area that requires additional training. So every every dentist can do this, every, every hygienist. They just need a little bit of extra training on management of a more complex medical or physical uh, challenge that a patient may have. Take it from a mom, the clinic is desperately needed. You can make your trip to the dentist a little, a little less stressful. It looks fine too. And the next big challenge for the school is finding the right workforce to train the staff. The clinic is set to open in January 2024, and of course, it's going to serve the insured as well as the uninsured. Steve, Stephania. What a huge help to some of the families out there. Thank you, Patty. Well, new on the night beat, it's a community that's lived through tragedy, and now a nonprofit is hoping to help with healing by building a custom playground in Uvalde. The mock-up of that playground unveiled today. It was designed by the community and families of the Robb Elementary victims. The new playground will go in De Leon Park. The current wooden equipment there, it's going to be torn down by the city. It's actually, the new playground will be built by a company called Kaboom, a national nonprofit that aims to bring play equipment to underserved communities. Lisa Ratliff, the CEO of Kaboom, says she hopes this park helps the community bring some joy and healing. Certainly when we're able to see the joy of people coming together, um, that plays a role in us seeing something, you know, kind of the life that's here. It plays a role in healing. So our hope is that it can play a small part in helping the community heal. And you can help as well. Work on the park's going to start October 13th. It's going to be done on October 15th. And all of it will be done by hand. So they need some volunteers, 250 of them. If you want to help, we have a link to sign up on ksat.com. I'm sure it's going to be a lovely event. Mm. Just a nice thing for the community to come together. All right, now you're getting a live look here by the Pearl. It's a sign that says Cultura Orgullo Corazón, which means uh, just Orgullo Corazón. Heart, culture, pride. Yes, because my friends, Hispanic Heritage Month kicks off tomorrow. It goes from September 15th to October 15th. And you can only imagine this is a pretty nice time to have events outside, right? It's getting better, that's for sure. It's especially getting better to have events outside. And you even notice it in the afternoon. Like today, we had to drop in the humidity. That was pleasant. Not too humid out there, even right now, when we typically see that humidity spiking. The, 
this trend isn't going to last all that much longer. I have to point that out. But it is going to lead to a cooler morning tomorrow, a little below average. And we also have Tropical Storm Fiona to talk about, the newest tropical cyclone in the Atlantic. So let's first get to the low temperatures. Tomorrow morning, 68 degrees. Okay, you think, okay, 68, yeah, whatever. But we haven't been that cool since May 26th. So should that verify, it'll go down as the coolest reading officially in San Antonio since late May. And as I mentioned, doesn't last long. We're back into the 70s for morning temperatures shortly thereafter. You look at readings across the state. You notice Amarillo at 70. Lubbock right now 71, Midland 71, Alpine 64. That's where we had some showers, rain cooled air. Elsewhere, we're upper 70s, close to 80 degrees. Hondo at an even 80. San Antonio, exactly 80 degrees. Del Rio right now at 83. Bernie 77, Castroville 81, and Seguin 75. Here's what's important though. Dew points are still in the upper 50s, right near 60. So dew points fell off quite a bit this afternoon because drier air above us mixed downward. Now that happens a lot, but this was especially drier air above us. And the dew points will rebound a bit overnight. They'll rise a bit, but not enough to really boost our morning temperatures that much higher because we look at these dew points, not just for the comfort level, but also an indicator of just how low the temperature can go at night. It's basically the low end threshold of how cool it can get at night and in the early morning. And with these dew points staying relatively low, we're talking low temperatures in the upper 60s for us. So even Uvalde, 68, Carrizo Springs, 69. You get up into the hill country, low to mid 60s. Bernie and Timberwood Park, about 64. And I think San Antonio, about 68 officially for the low temperature in the morning. Again, not that significant overall, you know, when you look at the whole year, but when we haven't had 68 degrees or anything under, under 69 since late May, it's going to be noticeable. High temperatures, though. Still low to mid 90s, no big changes there. And we typically see our first cold front that gives us a 10 degree drop in late September. We're still looking for it out there. It's not on the horizon quite yet. You look at the satellite and radar today. I mentioned those showers, Panhandle, West Texas, even down toward beautiful Alpine. That's where we had the rain, some heavy areas of rain. It's being pushed away from us though. Upper level high, basically over Arkansas and eastern Oklahoma right now and it's deflecting that Pacific moisture up and around us and once that high moves out it's going to be replaced by a new one so a new big blue H is going to move overhead and that one I think will be a bit stronger into next week uh, pretty much eliminating our rain chances with the exception of right along the Gulf Coast but that's not going to be associated with tropical storm Fiona nope 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 likely to remain a tropical storm heading toward Haiti Dominican Republic by Monday of next week still a tropical storm or maybe even tropical depression at that point no threat to the US us right now. 68 in the morning tomorrow, 75 at 9 a.m. We warm up quickly by noon. We're 86 and then a high temperature of 93 degrees. Yes, a 10% chance of a shower. One or two stray pop ups the next few afternoons. 10 to 20% chance every afternoon through Saturday. All right, Adam. Thank you. All right. Turning to sports and it's time for an obscure sitcom reference. Okay. Go for it. It looks as if the Cowboys are hanging with Mr. Cooper. <laughs> yeah, they do have confidence in Coop. In this particular case, Cooper Rush, when we come back, why are they feeling that confidence with Dak Prescott sidelined for at least the next couple of weeks, if not more? And pop surprise visit to Las Vegas Aces coming up. You don't need me, that's for sure. But it was great watching you guys play. It's been great watching you on TV. And the way you execute, the way you play physically, it's, it's just beautiful to watch. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich makes a surprise visit to Las Vegas Aces locker room after their second straight win in the WNBA Finals with his protege, Becky Hammond, now one win away from the title. But first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys star quarterback Dak Prescott back at the start today, just two days after having surgery on his throwing hand to repair a fracture just below his right thumb. Right now, the Cowboys are going with Cooper Rush and Will Greer and not bringing in another quarterback because of the optimistic sooner than later return of Prescott. So why does the team feel they can rush, uh, that Rush can run this team for the short haul, starting with Cincinnati on Sunday? Coop's been here a long time. He's a very smart guy. He knows exactly what's going on. Uh, but there's always kind of that, like, I wonder how we'll do in a, in a game. And 
Uh, I think he kind of showed that last year in the Minnesota game, came in, did a great job, got a win. and um, So I think everyone's got the, all the confidence in the world in him. I know, I know Dak's got all the confidence in the world in him. So the nice thing is Coop, Coop's very locked into what's going on. He, he's a very smart guy, so um, there's really no difference there. All right, meantime, the Houston Texans coming out of their 2020 tie with the Indianapolis Colts. And one of the big targets for quarterback Davis Mills, the tight end O.J. Howard, who only had one week of practice before being thrown into Sunday's game after being cut by the Buffalo Bills. As a result, two big touchdowns in that game. How valuable was that? Extremely valuable. He came in, got to work immediately um, early last week, really. And, I mean, knew he wasn't going to be in in the whole offense, but those plays where we had him available, he was going to be um, a master of what he did. When he was in there, he stretched the field vertically and made really good plays. And I mean, we're confident that he's going to keep doing that. All right, next up, the Denver Broncos with Russell Wilson as their quarterback after their season opening 17 16 loss to the Seattle Seahawks on Monday Night Football. When the UTSA Roadrunners face the Texas Longhorns for the first time in school history, they know they will be competing in front of the largest crowd they've ever seen. They have been preparing for that this week as well. It's how the Longhorns have improved from Steve Sarkeesian's first year. Just look at what their defense did against the number one ranked team in the nation and had that both of their quarterbacks not have been injured in that game. What might have been? What has head coach Jeff Trailer noticed in Sark's second season in Austin? They're different. I mean, they're, uh, they're really experienced on the D-line and on the O-line they're just way more massive. I know they're playing some younger kids but they're, they're as good a player as they are in the country for, for their position. So I, I would say interiorly and I, I've always thought that uh, Bijan and Roshan are two of the best backs in the entire country. I've had tons of respect for them for, them for a long time and uh, nothing I've seen a video would, has made me change my mind for dang sure. They're, they're really different backs. It will be interesting to see just how much we see from B. John Robinson after he suffered a shoulder injury against the Crimson Tide. And with more than likely a third-string quarterback calling the shots, how much they will use Roshan Johnson in the Wildcat. After playing the number one team in the country and almost pulling out the upset of the year in just the second game of the season, the Texas Longhorns have got to make sure they don't be let UTSA become that trap game. Even after the 20-19 loss, the Longhorns are getting huge praise from all over college football and fans and teams alike. After hanging with the best college football program in the country in only their 10th overall meeting and their first since the 2009 BCS championship game. Remember, the Horns are down to their third string quarterback in Charles Wright. He only took snaps in one game last year to blow out of Texas Tech. So head coach Steve Sarkis and issued this caution as they prepare for the Roadrunners this weekend. To quote uh, my old boss, we got to be careful of the rat poison of, of uh, people telling us how good we are, um, which, which is important. You know, a week ago, everyone told us how bad we were, and now this week, everyone wants to tell us how good we are. And we got to be careful to quiet the noise outside of our building and focus on us, be enamored with us, and focus on our preparation. Kick off at Royal Memorial Stadium on Saturday night in Austin between UTSA and Texas will be at 7 p.m. and KSAT 12 Sports will be there. What else did Pop have to say in his address to his first year coach Becky Hammond and her Las Vegas Aces? Next. For me, I always tell my teams the sweetest wins are which ones? The ones on the road. The ones on the road, baby. <laughs> the ones on the road and that's where you're going. They're the sweetest. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich dropped in on the Las Vegas Aces locker room last night after their 85-71 victory over the Connecticut Sun. To put his protege, Becky Hammond, one went away from her first ever WNBA championship in her first season as a WNBA head coach. Is that incredible or what? And the reason why they're talking so much about road games is because their next game is on the road in Connecticut and they could sweep them right out of the playoffs in the finals with a win tomorrow night. That'd make it extra sweet. You sure would. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You Thank got it. You. We'll be right back after this. This is one job that you're going to want to apply to. If you're looking to binge watch a few horror films, the Dish Satellite TV service wants to hire somebody to watch 13 films based on Stephen King novels and pay them $1,300. Now, you have to be 18 to apply. You do so online at usdish.com. Pretty cool. Yeah. And some people have probably already seen them all anyway. So Watch them again and get paid yeah. for it. Good night.